Okay, we have everyone on board, uh, our five panelists and myself. Um, so I would like to uh, start with Mike, presenting Mike's uh, bio, and then after Mike finishes his presentation, I'm going to introduce the rest of the panel. So in the meantime, if I can ask the other panelists to switch off the video, uh, please. So Mike, uh, thank you for joining us uh, from Fleet, uh, from Australia again. Since 2017, Mike has been director uh, of strategy, uh, telecommunication strategy for Fleet uh, Space Technologies. Uh, during which time uh, Fleet has delivered uh, five non-GSO IoT payloads into orbits. Um, he has extensive experience in ICT, satellite, wireless communications, and spatial systems uh, with the Department of Defense, a Prime Minister's Department, and IBM, before founding international consulting company Coded and VSAT provider APN. After the sales of APN, Mike then worked for 10 years with NewSat and Speedcast on delivery of GSO payloads and large ground segment projects. Uh, so, uh, Mike, uh, welcome to the conference. And uh, please, you can start whenever you can uh, by sharing your screen uh, with your presentation. We'll give you uh, five, six minutes for your keynote. And and then we take uh, some questions from the audience before then going to the main panel. Thank you. Okay. Excuse me, but my <clears throat> screen, hopefully you're seeing that. So <clears throat> uh, thank you everyone. And um, I'm very pleased to be part of this uh, uh, panel today. Um, <clears throat> As Tony said, I'm the Director of Telecom Strategies for Fleet Space Technology. We're an Australian startup company uh, dedicated to setting up an infrastructure for industrial, so large scale Internet of Things. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, if we go to the next slide, I will flick through these slides uh, because there are a fair few to present in a short space of time. Um, but uh, we are focused on uh, we're at the moment in a sort of an inflection point with low Earth orbit uh, populations and uh, internet from space is set to transform the broadband side. But on our third slide, thanks, Tony. The more interesting thing for us is that in 2020, Internet of Things connections worldwide overtook internet connections. So things past people as internet connectors in, uh, in 2020. So internet of things is not really in its infancy. It's uh, taking huge strides uh, despite COVID and despite uh, some uh, time in getting to market. Uh, internet of things has continued to grow at an exponential rate. And uh, as I say, is now uh, showing more connections than people. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Also, narrowband tech is transforming the industry so that there are now 145 million devices deployed around the world and 80% of those devices are part of uh, use cases that are covered by uh, LoRa, so uh, uh, long-range, low-power, wide-area networks. Next slide, please. Fleet is focused on uh, three of those breakthrough technologies, nano satellites, and we've been developing and launching nano satellites since our inception in 2016. Smart gateways, we consider smart gateways and edge devices to be an essential component of IoT. Uh, what we don't think you should be doing is putting a lot of uh, director satellite uh, uh, items out in the field that are going to tr transmit largely uh, uh, largely signals that are uh, just saying that, uh, uh, that everything's okay. We really think that uh, you need to have smart gateways and you need to have edge devices to massage the data. We're talking about huge volumes of data of which 90% are going to be reporting nominal conditions. And we don't think that that traffic should transit any, any networks. 
and also low power wireless is an essential component because we need to integrate lots of sensors on the ground, not just our ones and twos, but uh, thousands of these sensors and they don't all need to connect to the host or to the, uh, uh, to the central point in the cloud. Next one, please. So Fleet uh, has uh, developed a constellation of satellites called Centauri. We had an initial two satellites called Proxima. And uh, if you go to the next slide, our first two Centauri satellites were a bit more basic than, uh, than our most recent one. We, uh, we launched uh, three weeks ago, Centauri 3, and that's uh, passed its uh, on-orbit testing and it's going very well. Uh, next slide, please. There's a view of Centauri 3 and uh, uh, its payload has been fully developed by us. And in fact, we developed 25 payloads for the three satellites that we've uh, put up there so far, uh, partly because we want the ability to develop lots of payloads in a hurry and partly because we see the payloads as a commodity that we need to be able to shape uh, for different iterations of Centauri. Next slide, please. That's a uh, happy snap of all the people who worked on the, on the Centauri 3 before it uh, launched. Next one, please. The Centauri program began in uh, 2018. And uh, we, as you can see, we've launched uh, Proxima 1 and 2 with Rocket Labs. We launched Centauri 1 with ISRO in India. We launched Centauri 3 with SpaceX out of the US. And then we launched Centauri 3 uh, again uh, three weeks ago with Rocket Lab. And uh, we are planning to launch Centauri 4 in a few months and Centauri 5 at the end of 2021. And after that, you'll see on the right-hand side that we're starting to launch in batches of five, maybe batches of 10, depending on how well we're going at that stage. So we've under, undertaken quite an uh, ambitious program and we have five uh, satellites to show for it and we'll very soon have large numbers of satellites. If we go to the next slide. We've launched... Uh, more nano satellites, <coughs> excuse me, than any other space uh, Australian space company. Uh, and we're just at a pivotal point. We go to our next satellite where we have filed for 140 nano satellites to go into orbit. And uh, we're currently mass producing the payload that we need for those. And uh, we see that there's um, a need for us to get into the manufacturing side a lot more actively than we have so far. And so we've put a proposal to the Australian government to allow us to expand that aspect of our operations. And uh, we expect to ramp that up significantly by the end of this year. Next slide, please. The other thing that <clears throat> has been a distinguishing factor of fleet is that we've designed our network in a modular fashion so that we can start uh, selling services to customers before we've got our satellites up just by using other commercial networks. And so we have uh, uh, a good range of customers who already have IoT deployed in the field in the verticals of electricity, uh, major utilities, hydro, oil and gas and mining. And you can see that we've focused on low duty cycle uh, components to start with or applications to start with. And uh, as we increase the number of satellites we have on orbit, then we'll work our way down that table in terms of applications. Next slide, please. Also, just to uh, talk about our role in uh, uh, proposing to the Artemis uh, missions to the moon, we've got a uh, Seven Sisters um, proposal that we've developed in conjunction with a range of Australian universities and, uh, uh, and commercial organisations. Uh, go to the next slide, thank you. Uh, the idea is to utilise uh, technology that we're already deploying on the ground for a mining company, uh, ambient noise tomography that allows for mineral explora exploration without invasive drilling. And uh, we're already deploying that for a company in the north of South Australia. 
and uh, we have a proposal to implement that type of application on the moon. Uh, if you go to our next slide, please. And you'll see the various components. We, Fleet is the lead, lead agency, um, but we have a mining company, Oz Minerals, and uh, a best of collection of companies and uh, uh, cooperative research centers and universities that uh, will be participants in, in this program if we're successful. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, I'd like to table just a few issues for discussion in the panel. Uh, firstly, that uh, uh, we don't have uh, a sufficient global satellite IoT spectrum allocation. It's uh, um, something that will impede the industry going forward, something that we need to consider as an industry if we are going to be truly competitive. And uh, uh, we have workarounds and most companies have workarounds, but it's imperative longer term that the industry lobbies to have uh, much more consistent access to spectrum. Uh, supply chain issues for manufacturing have been a huge issue for small sats in the last year and a half. They were already an issue, but during COVID, they've become uh, quite difficult. Regulatory hurdles are always uh, an interesting topic for discussion. Um, additive manufacturing uh, is the future of this industry. And uh, we have been working in that area, especially in getting 3D printing for our uh, on-orbit uh, antennas, but we would like to expand that much more out to the bus and the payload components. Uh, space debris and propulsion is an interesting quandary for small sats at the moment because uh, the FCC and NASA are proposing that all small, uh, or that all satellites in LEO have propulsion. Uh, and because of the parameters they've put forward, you read chemical propulsion for that. We don't think that's a good idea. Um, we do think that collision avoidance is a good idea, but chemical propulsion, not so much. And so uh, uh, that's something we think would be worth discussing in the panel. And finally, uh, SmallSat uh, IoT lobby and leverage. We think there needs to be um, focus from the IoT industry uh, as distinct from the small sat industry because we do have a slightly different set of requirements that we need to put forward and uh, uh, we would like to see that happen in a more coordination, uh, coordinated fashion in the IoT world. And uh, last slide, thank you. Mike, we need uh, to finish now, please. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Uh, the last slide is uh, Fleet Space Connect Everything. We see that as our mission as... Uh, an IoT provider, we're putting a terrestrial, global terrestrial, global satellite and uh, uh, a cloud-based database together to connect everything. And we're a long way along the way. So I'd uh, enjoy discussing any uh, aspect of that with, uh, the, with uh, people during the panel session. Thanks very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh... I'm going to move on to the panelists now, Mike. Uh, we'll get the questions after. After, uh, so let me introduce the uh, uh, next panelists. Uh, and then one by one, they can present. They can do a presentation. Uh, Mike, if you can switch off your video at, the, at this time. Yep. Okay. So let me introduce first Sanjay. This the CEO of Driva Space. Uh, he's a seasoned entrepreneur in the space industry with rich experience in working with startups and mid-sized business uh, building products and services in the area of small satellites, satcoms, technology, sensors, and connected devices. So let me get uh, Sanjay first to uh, do his presentation. Uh, Sanjay, you have uh, four minutes for this. Thank you. Uh, Tony, could you confirm if the screen is full? Yes, I, I can see everything. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Tony, for the introduction. Uh, namaste, good morning, and good afternoon to uh, a lot of you guys here. Uh, we are a full stack uh, space engineering solutions company uh, based in here. Uh, we work on the space cycle launch segment and ground segment. On the space segment, we build uh, platforms uh, to support uh, 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 different types of uh, missions. We are application agnostic uh, that way. 
on the launch segment, uh, we build uh, CubeSats deployers right now that are compatible with multiple launch weight. On the ground segment, uh, we build uh, ground units, including full Earth stations, so that people can use them to command control satellites. And some of these systems could also be used as attachments to sensors for communicating with satellite orbits. Uh, Thibault is a, a stack sensor division that provides uh, solutions for sensing, data acquisition, analytics, and management. This is enabled via multiple communication solutions, including satellite connectivity. Thibault is a fully owned entity of uh, Druva Space. Uh, some of the case studies that I just wanted to present uh, for, the, uh, for the audience here, is, uh, we're working with this American organization for who, uh, we are building uh, different uh, satellite subsystems that are being used as part of their missions. Uh, we are actually building, um, uh, we'll be offering on service uh, for an Indian cast, Indian client uh, whose CubeSat will be launched using our uh, proprietary deployer. Uh, for a North American company, we're establishing earth stations for uh, uh, payload data downlink uh, over India and a couple of other places. Uh, for a European company, we are actually, uh, through Thaipol, we are looking at uh, production capacities of uh, large amounts of sensors, which I will let this later. Uh, these are some of our products on the space segment. We have the PDOT platform, uh, which is uh, uh, scalable uh, up to 6U CubeSat. Uh, we have P30, which is more of a nanosatellite platform. And the P90 is more of a microsatellite platform. These uh, different variants of these platforms can be used for a different variety of uh, missions. Uh, these are our products on the uh, uh, launch segment, a combination of these deploy and be launch uh, can be utilized to launch more than 100 satellites in one go. Uh, these are some of our problems the ground segment uh, with uh, standalone antenna systems. We also then uh, already delivered uh, LEO telemetry tracking stations. We are uh, building uh, such, uh, antennas up to 7.2 meters for supporting uh, high fidelity data rate requirements. Uh, our uh, production so we uh, utilize an ecosystem of uh, various partners in India uh, to support uh, production of satellites and sensors. Uh, so uh, this is local ecosystem uh, which we utilize for producing uh, uh, sensors faster, cheaper, and in a reliable way. This enables us to scale from prototypes to market-ready products at the rate of up to 100,000 units a month. Uh, Thank you. I uh, just wanted to show you uh, the, this uh, half you platform that we're building for Casper. And uh, there's a small uh, one you deployer that is being used uh, by some of the players. Uh, just to give you a um, scale, uh, this is the P30 platform that's being used for multi payload missions. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. We're going to now move to the next. Uh... Speaker Alexander uh, Tissera, CEO of CNES. He became CNES CEO after two years at CLS, uh, a commercial subsidiary of CNES, hence setting up the CNES project. Alexander also served in various French government departments at the cabinet of the Secretary of State for Digitalization and Innovation from 2015 to 2017 and the budget department of the Ministry of Finance. So thank you, Alexander, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Tony, for the invitation uh, at uh, this uh, panel. So um, let me talk to you a little about uh, Kines. I won't be long because we are numerous uh, panelists. Um, so in short, uh, who are we? We are uh, Kines is a global satellite uh, operator and a connectivity provider uh, dedicated to the IOC, the IoT, sorry, the Internet of Things. Uh, so today we already have um, eight uh, payloads that are flying on the uh, um, partners' uh, satellites uh, in uh, LEO uh, at an altitude uh, around 800 kilometers. And uh, it's uh, the inheritance of uh, the Argo system uh, that we are now the um, exclusive uh, operator. And so thanks to the system today, we have 20,000 devices connected. Uh, we'll talk a bit about uh, later uh, what uh, the kind of application we, we have on that. Um, and the Kinase project is to launch uh, 25 uh, more nano satellites in uh, early 2023 to uh, 650 kilometers uh, polar uh, uh, SSO orbits to uh, complete uh, the constellation and above all democratize access to uh, IoT uh, space IoT connectivity. 
So this uh, 25 high power nanosats will be uh, enough to cover the, the entire globe and have a, a near real time connectivity um, with a dedicated uh, ground station network around the world uh, that we are currently uh, deploying. So <clears throat> the system allows you uh, already today and will uh, also tomorrow with the Kinesis uh, uh, more satellites uh, to connect uh, anything on Earth uh, from pole to pole, desert to oceans, uh, whatever uh, you can uh, and you want to, to connect. Uh, it's a two-way communication system with 30 byte messages um, with also uh, native location available uh, thanks to uh, Doppler effect uh, calculations. Um, so all, all that in the in the the aim of uh, optimizing the uh, energy consumption on the device so that at the end of the day you have a device that is miniaturized uh, at best and with a, a very good uh, autonomy uh, in time <coughs> sorry the point also is that with the constellation uh, we uh, on the satellites of the constellation we have a propulsion on board electrical propulsion uh, which means that we can really have a, a phase the constellation we can maintain the position of each satellite and so uh, we can we are able to uh, guarantee uh, sla uh, to our customers we are fully financed uh, as of now we have raised 100 million euros uh, last year <clears throat> that will allow us to uh, build and deploy launch uh, both the satellites and the ground station and the data center to uh, uh, give this connectivity uh, fuller reality. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and so what do we sell beyond connectivity? Of course, uh, the business model is based on uh, connectivity uh, uh, um, and uh, airtime, uh, but uh, to make this available, we also uh, sell uh, at cost um, hardware to uh, facilitate the development of uh, uh, IoT uh, ecosystem. So we have uh, chipsets uh, that are doing all the RF uh, uh, modulation needed to uh, send to the satellite and receive uh, information from the satellites. Uh, we also integrate them into small modules that you can integrate either uh, on, um, on uh, IoT, uh, satellite IoT only uh, devices, or you can also integrate them into existing LoRa devices. We have a full strategy based on uh, hybridization with um, terrestrial network because we strongly believe that uh, uh, terrestrial and satellite are not competitors, but uh, uh, complement uh, Tari networks. Uh, and also, obviously, we have uh, all the dev kits needed to test the connectivity of the shelf uh, devices uh, that can help any integrator uh, or uh, potential reseller to test uh, and uh, deploy the, the connectivity. So what are we talking about application? Today, we have uh, mostly our sensors uh, um, connected for application uh, dedicated to science and environment, also uh, uh, little on, the, on fishing boats. And uh, we are developing uh, new markets. Uh, uh, smart agriculture is a really great one uh, with application of uh, monitoring uh, either soils or uh, animals uh, with uh, animal uh, uh, tracking. Also, uh, application like monitoring uh, silos of, uh, of grains. Um, a lot of demand uh, on the side of logistics and industry uh, for uh, either supply chain tracking or uh, network uh, monitoring like power network, oil network, uh, water network. So the main difficulty here is to have the really good device with the really good price point because uh, this uh, market is re really uh, uh, targeting uh, low cost uh, uh, devices. And also we have a B2C application that we are uh, developing for outdoor enthusiasts. Um, when you go uh, in uh, trekking for like uh, a week, and uh, you need to have a bus tracking system and also um, search and rescue system. We combine both in a, in a small beacon, a, a portable beacon um, that will allow uh, to send messages to, uh, with satellites and also to send um, search and rescue signals thanks to uh, SAR uh, connectivity uh, um, uh, today. So uh, that's mainly uh, what we are doing at, at Kines today. I, I won't be... Uh, uh, longer because we are uh, with our other panelists. Uh, thank you, everyone. I can answer any question, uh, of course. 
Excellent. Thank you so much for uh, that, Alexander. I'm going to ask Laurent now. I'm going to present Laurent. He's responsible for the marketing, regulatory, PMO, <coughs> and product management department. Prior to joining Astrocast, Laurent spent more than 15 years managing international projects in the energy and aerospace sector. He also has experience in entrepreneurship, business development, non for profit organizations. Thank you so much, Laurent. We can start. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. And good morning, everyone. I hope you can see my presentation. Yes. Okay. So I'm, I'm the CEO of Astrocast. Uh, happy to present you what we do today. There might be some similarities with what Alexander and Mike have just presented as we are playing in the same markets, but it's always great to compare approaches and, uh, and exchange ideas. Um, so what we do in a nutshell, um, we also are in the satellite IoT business. So you know that 90% of the world remains today without terrestrial connectivity. The only solution is to go through satellite, but this remains expensive and delivers more than what IoT connectivity needs, which is why companies like ours have developed new solutions based on the new space approach that uh, Adam spoke about uh, earlier. So we offer a comprehensive end-to-end -end connectivity solution direct to orbit, which means that each asset is connected directly to the constellation. Being a gas tank or a turtle, it can be directly connected to the constellation without the need for further infrastructure on the ground nor uh, gateways. Uh, we have miniaturized terminals, um, two-way communication as well, low power, and uh, everything is developed internally, satellites, modules, Customer portal API, we develop everything and we have that comprehensive solution for our customers. We are global, we have seamless coverage, so no roaming. Um, it's a cost effective solution compared to what's existing today. And, um, and, and, and yes, we have this, um, this dev kit also for uh, quick testing for customers. In less than 24 hours, you can set up your connection and start uh, sending messages on the constellation. And then we have these modules and miniaturized then uh, ASIC for uh, for mass production. In terms of in terms of use cases, we uh, tackle different verticals, um, a bit the same as uh, Alexander presented earlier. So we have environmental um, applications, customers in water infrastructure. In monitoring weather stations, we have a customer also uh, uh, monitoring glacier melting. We have also customers in agriculture and livestock, uh, tracking of wild animals, for instance. We can uh, monitor assets. Uh, we have applications in mining, oil and gas, monitoring of gas tanks, and also maritime and connected vehicles. Um, these applications, connected vehicles, for instance, uh, require a latency lower than what we have today, but we'll, we'll achieve this uh, within the next few years. So the company exists since 2014. We had two demonstration satellites since 2018, but we're commercially live since January this year with five satellites. Uh, that we've launched on board uh, SpaceX. We'll launch more satellites this year, 15, and we'll have uh, a full constellation of 100 satellites by 2024. We are fast growing. We have customers uh, already in Europe, Africa, APAC. And I encourage you to check our website. There's much more information on the offering and the technology and the team also. We are a team now of, of 68 people. And really fast growing business, as, uh, as my co-panelist uh, said, uh, and really it's just the beginning. And that is it. I'm, I'm welcoming any question at the end of the panel. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Laurent. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next panelist now. Um, Khalid Alawadi from UAE. Uh, is the manager of broadcasting and space services at the Telecommunication Digital Regulatory Authority of uh, UAE. 
is primary responsibility spectrum management for broadcasting and space services in the UAE, as well as the PMSC requirements. As a member of the licensing committee uh, in the TDRA, uh, they just changed their name recently, actually. Um, uh, it used to be called the TRA. He is also involved in attending uh, to inquiries and receiving from the industry regarding services provision in the UAE. And how he was also a member of the UAE Space Agency core team when this was actually established a couple of years back. Halid, the floor is yours and with a nice presentation as well from yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. I appreciate uh, the introduction. Uh, unfortunately, I'd like to, uh, uh, for you to accept my apologies. I, I don't have a presentation actually to present, but uh, I'm going to uh, understand as well. Maybe uh, my situation is a bit different. Uh, I'm, I'm not having a product to showcase. I'm actually a regulator. Uh, we regulate uh, the telecom sector in the United Arab Emirates. So I'll just uh, uh, give you a, a short brief about uh, what we do and how, uh, what is the strategy that uh, we're following in, 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 in regulating the uh, telecom sector and uh, including the space services in the UAE. So basically, uh, we are the telecommunication regulatory authority. We are the regulators of the telecom sector as per the uh, law by decree number three of 2003. So we've been established since then. And we've been looking at the uh, 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 telecom sector at the beginning, but recently uh, the digital government uh, mandate has been uh, granted to us by the federal government. So uh, in the TRA or the TDRA for the time being, we have two main sectors. The first sector is the telecom regulator, and then the second one is the digital government. Uh, of course, uh, providing the telecom services and uh, uh, including IoT as well is, is part of the mandates in the uh, telecom sector. Uh, we look at the, uh, uh, at the issue from uh, three main perspectives. Uh, the first one is uh, looking at the spectrum management of, uh, uh, of the telecom services being provided in the country. Uh, so we have different regulations and policies with regards to how uh, spectrum is being managed in the in the country in the UAE. Of course, we have our national table of frequency allocation, which is basically following the uh, uh, table of frequency allocations included with the radio regulation of the ITU. So uh, basically, our work uh, it goes closely with the work in the ITU with the uh, agenda items of the WRC and and what decisions, whatever decisions are made there, they directly reflect uh, how we. Uh, allocate the frequencies to different uh, uh, services in our national table of frequency allocation. Of course, all the other uh, spectrum usage is, is subject to the, the regulatory framework, the spectrum regulatory framework, which is uh, available in our website. I would uh, encourage everyone to, to access the TRA's uh, website and have a look at the uh, uh, regulatory uh, framework for spectrum uh, management. So that is one aspect. Then we have the second aspect, which is the regulatory part of the uh, of, of, of telecommunications. Of course, according to the uh, telecom law, uh, we indicate or the telecom law indicates uh, 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 what constitutes a regulated activity in the UAE. So as per the law, any regulated activity is, request, is required to obtain uh, a telecom license from the uh, TDRA. Uh, uh, right now, we have uh, 10 licensees in the, in the country uh, comprising of uh, uh, terrestrial uh, service providers like the uh, mobile service providers. And uh, as well, we have some satellite service providers in the, the country. Uh, so that aspect of looking at uh, service provisioning and, and the uh, legal and regulatory requirements is the second aspect of looking at uh, regulating the telecom uh, sector. The third, uh, the third uh, part is the technology development. We look at the quality of services being provided. Uh, we have to register all the equipment that are uh, uh, existing in the country uh, that are operational in the TRAs and in the UAE. So all equipment has to be uh, registered uh, by, the, uh, by the TDRA. With regards to the IoT and, and, uh, and the IoT service provisioning, we've recently uh, uh, had this uh, issue into consideration. Uh, in 2018, we've uh, established the IoT policy from the, from the TDRA, uh, as well as the uh, 
uh, IoT uh, regulatory procedures. So we have a certain set of rules and regulations for any IoT service provider to provide the services in the, in the country. Uh, we've identified that IoT services are not considered as a regulated activity. So uh, entities who require to uh, 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 provide IoT services in the UAE, they are not required to obtain a license, but they need to get uh, an IoT certification, IoT service certification from the, from the PDRA. Uh, so uh, the IoT generally, the way we look at it is a generic term. We not look at the IoT only from the space uh, perspective. However, uh, IoT using satellites is, of course, allowed and possible. So any entity who's uh, requested or, or uh, interested in providing IoT services via satellite, they are uh, welcome to approach us in the TDRA, and uh, we would provide them with the appropriate guidance. This guidance is also available online, uh, as I said, from the regulatory instruments that we have, and they can have a look at uh, what uh, procedure they have uh, to do. And uh, we will be more than happy to collaborate with uh, all the entities. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Khalid, um, uh, for your um, presentation. Don't worry, uh, it was not required to have any slides. Uh, so you did extremely well in presenting the case for, for UAE. Uh, can I please have all the panelists uh, on board now with your video? We'll have a couple of questions from the audience and then we'll do, uh, I'll, I'll do a couple of questions from the audience first. Uh, then uh, I will uh, pick up the points which Mike uh, raised earlier and also yourself, uh, between yourselves, you may want to ask other things. Um, don't worry about time. Uh, we have until 9.40. Uh, so we do have quite a, a good time to uh, have a good discussion in this panel, uh, basically. Um, so uh, let me first uh, uh, put yourself in gallery view so I can take a photograph of you and... Uh, we can save that for later. Perfect. Um, so in terms of the questions from the audience, um, I'm going to pick up the first one from Peter DeSelding. Um, for the IoT panel, Mike mentioned uh, the need for more spectrum for IoT. Uh, and he says, I guess everybody wants that. Uh, well, there's not enough. I, I can say that for sure. I, I also follow the ITU uh, spectrum issues. If so, then what are you going to do be doing uh, by national regulate regional regulators to get it. What, what, what's the what's the steps to get more spectrum for IoT services? Let's have this discussion between yourselves. Okay, I, I can uh, I can begin to answer. Um, I think there is a um, currently ongoing discussion on uh, opening some spectrum on the high, uh, higher higher uh, frequency that we are doing. Uh, Right now, Kenny, so maybe uh, around uh, S band, and um, and so the, the first steps I would say uh, on that is uh, first to identify what could be uh, a good opportunity, uh, technically speaking, um, maybe to have some test uh, in flight, and uh, then to push forward a proposition for the the next, the next uh, um, WRC. Uh, and then uh, see uh, from that uh, what could be uh, what could be done. This is one track. There is another track that uh, I don't see uh, today how it will uh, really uh, go. But uh, um, there are a lot of uh, buzz around uh, uh, LoRa by satellite or NBIoT by satellite. And um, I, I, as we are speaking now, I, I didn't see um, any good. Uh, uh, technical solution uh, working for that. And so this may be at some point uh, some uh, standard that is emerging, but from now, uh, I, I don't know. So there is also one uh, technical front, I think, on that to at least to, to follow and to see then after that uh, what, can, what can be done, if any. Maybe Hali, there's um, a couple of suggestions of where we can find more spectrum for IoT systems. I, I, think, I think, Tony, you felt me going there and trying to talk about that. <laughs> In fact, yes, I think, I think that's, that's a very interesting uh, topic uh, uh, that we really need to, to have a discussion on. Um, let's, start, let's start with IoT as, as a concept, as a whole. 
for us and in, in the, in the, as a regulator of, of the UAE, uh, we allow uh, IoT services to be provided based on the spectrum regulation, which is called ultra wideband and SRD regulations. So we have a certain frequencies uh, that are in, uh, included in the SRD regulation and IoT uh, equipment can utilize these SRD uh, frequencies to provide IoT services. Uh, that is usually uh, the case when we talk about terrestrial IoT services. Uh, last year, we had a lot of uh, uh, applications. We had in, in 2020, we had something like 23 applications for IoT service provisioning in the country. But none of these uh, uh, applications were from satellite providers. They were all uh, terrestrial IoT uh, services. And uh, the, the case was straightforward. They have a regulation. They know exactly what frequencies they can utilize. In the, in the space sector, on the space segment, I think, as Alexander as well have mentioned, I think there was a very good opportunity that was opened up for us in WRC-19. There was uh, one issue, if you remember, Tony, which was uh, 912, I think, issue 912, which was talking about uh, the terrestrial and satellite uh, components of uh, uh, IMT. And there was a, a good portion of MSS frequency that got vacated or got uh, opened for satellite uh, 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 operators to utilize in the S band. Uh, and as a regulator, I've seen actually some applications coming up to us, uh, not, not directly to the IoT application, but some requests for satellite services to utilize this S band. So I think that S band is, is something which is available there for people to grab and get the opportunity to provide uh, the IoT services. There is a, actually a new agenda item for the next World, World Conference in 2023, uh, which is looking for frequencies between one and three gigahertz. So we are in the range of the L-band, S-band uh, side of frequencies. Um, because uh, many of the IoT operators, especially the European ones, I, I, I remember doing the last WRC, they were, they were fighting for more spectrum because there is not enough spectrum in, in the UHF and VHF bands, basically, for these new constellations, basically, these new satellite systems. Let me, let me just show you for a second uh, um, something which I put together. There was a consultation from uh, India just recently. Uh, for which uh, the Alliance, the Access Space Alliance has uh, responded to, uh, and also others uh, from your side respond to that consultation. And there is often also a confusion between uh, the IoT systems. Uh, there is the typical uh, terrestrial IoT, as Halley, Halley just mentioned, which actually transmit to a base station, basically. And these are using short-range short, short range devices, basically, which don't require to have necessarily an allocation on the table because they're so low-powered and they don't, create, they don't create interference. Uh, but there are some standard frequencies which could be used by these transmitters, uh, like 868 megahertz or, or lower in frequencies, for example. Um, and then the, the base station is connected with the modem to a satellite terminal, and that basically the, the typical, usual... Uh, satellite terminals that we find today with the existing services, basically. So that, but that, that is not the typical IoT satellite system because these satellite systems are not designed specifically to provide IoT as, as IoT uh, as a business model. That what we're talking about in this panel is that this this type of systems where the the the, the sensors are actually directly directly connected to the uh, satellite system. That's what uh, Kinase and uh, uh, Astrocast and, and others like, uh, I don't know, Fleet for, as well, they, they do actually incorporate the transmitter directly to the sensor. And, and of course, that has its own cost that may require also a, a, a battery that lasts, um, you know, years in effect. So that's what we're talking about, the frequency allocations to these satellite LEO system, which are today at this moment, uh, we can use 400 megahertz, for example, around 400 megahertz at the VHF, UHF bands. There is some bands at uh, UHF, but unfortunately, last WRC has not made a good job about the 137, 149 megahertz band with the short duration missions because it's, it's actually almost unusable from that perspective. And that's why we're now moving towards one three gigahertz in terms of the spectrum. I'm going to stop there. Sorry, I had, I've taken so much, but I wanted to make this clarification on, the, on what we're talking about today. 
Is there any any other comments from any other participants? Uh, yes, I I just um, would like to butt in there. I agree with Alexander. Actually, I, I think that we <clears throat> we need to be looking. Um, it, it's been acknowledged that uh, small set operators generally are requiring to buy components out of the market, and that very much restricts them to L band, UHF, and S band. So the the bands you're talking about. Um, Larger satellite operators are moving to the bands, uh, KU, KA band and higher bands uh, because they can, because they're larger satellites and also because uh, there's more freedom in those areas as uh, broadcast television declines in those areas, there's going to be capacity for them up there. But the small sat operators are confined by technology to an extent and uh, are in bands that are already congested and that we need to negotiate a way through. UHF doesn't have enough capacity in the areas in which there are class licenses. And so uh, there really needs to be some allocation there if that's going to become usable. And S-band is quite restricted in terms of uh, the filings and the coordination possibilities for it in some countries. So there's not consistent access around the world in uh, UHF and S-band, which are the two targets because of the um, software-defined radios, the antenna technologies are generally available to small sat operators. Uh, I would like to add a few points over here. I think in general, you know, if we, uh, if we look at it, you know, we have the regulator, we have the satellite operator, and then we have the end user. Uh, what we have seen uh, from the end user perspective is the user is usually asking for a grid network where uh, you know, the communication could happen through a terrestrial uh, network, you know, where uh, like uh, uh, how, you know, Mr. Khalid had mentioned uh, when they had this uh, opportunity, there were a lot of uh, uh, terrestrial IoT operators who came in and who just uh, filed for that spectrum. Now, what we are seeing from an uh, from a user perspective is the user is saying, "Hey, you know, we already have ground-based IoT sensors, uh, but you know, there are uh, some uh, uh, black spots where uh, we can provide connectivity." So, in those regions, can you uh, add that uh, you know uh, SATCOM uh, IoT layer to this ground IoT layer? So uh, I think uh, uh, as Druva and Kines, we, we are actually working on a uh, system which could uh, work on a uh, hybrid network uh, where we could commit both on a terrestrial uh, network, which could be cell or a Wi-Fi or the networks, have the satellite connectivity solution. I think the solution, um, the right solution for uh, you know this market to uh, go. Uh, to explore this, I think with the WRC, next WRC, uh, you know, there should be, uh, companies should be awarded uh, uh, the flexibility to experiment on multiple bus uh, so that uh, these things could rot up during the WRC meeting and a uh, direct framework. Uh, uh, Sanjay, um your communication, your sound is not perfect. Sometimes we cannot understand, but I think we got the most of your uh, your your talk. Uh, thank you for that. Any any comments from what Sanjay just mentioned from the other panelists or Mike? Yes, if I may, uh, Tony. I think um, what what Sanjay was uh, referring to is the alternate solutions other than the terrestrial. Uh, uh, IoT solutions that are existing uh, right now in, in, in many countries. I think, I recall the models that you've presented just now, Tony, model number two. So yes. model number two, where there is a, a terrestrial IoT network, and then there is a, a backhauling using the satellite. And I don't, th I, I don't think we have a, a difficulty in there because it's a, it's a, it's a satellite uh, let's say, a system that is having some sub certain spectrum in the KU band, maybe, and uh, they provide the backhauling for the, for the sensors. They, they don't have the difficulty of the requirement to connect to tiny sensors with very low power. So that's, that's, that's not a, a problem that we're, we're discussing. We're discussing the third category that you presented where you have the 
small sensors where the satellites have to communicate with these uh, sensors. Now, for, for a regulator, uh, as you recognize, Tony, uh, uh, until now, I, I don't have in the, uh, in the radio regulations a, 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 a direct allocation for IoT services. We, we have short-range devices. We have other services that are there that could be used, utilized for IoT. Actually, we do, uh, Khalid. Khalid. Uh, there is an MSS allocation which is being utilized today in 400 megahertz. So it is actually today targeted as an MSS. Yes, MSS, but it's a, a footnote. It's an MSS. Uh, it's an MSS allocation, but in the footnote, it says this uh, this MSS could be used for for IoT uh, applications. It's it's an application. It's not a, yes. a service. Yeah, it's like so, 5G. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So so we're targeting the MSS uh, frequencies if we're talking about um, uh, IoT services through satellites. Now this MSS. I think you, you do recognize, and I, I recall that you've been part of the uh, MLM MOU and the discussions on, on the L-band uh, MSS operations. Uh, it's a very scarce resource. And, and uh, as, as the panelists all have indicated, the L-band, the S-band, even the UHF, it's, it's, uh, it's a very scarce resource and it's very difficult to utilize it by all the operators. So yeah. we do recognize this, this uh, problem. Yes. I think I think you you, you touch on, on a good point. I mean, those those MSS allocations for L band, which are utilized by existing geostationary satellite systems, are, are not utilized directly for IoT systems. They are utilized for voice communications, for data communications. But what they can do, they can actually put a satellite terminal next to an IoT terrestrial network, and they can use it as a backhaul. But that's not saying that it's being utilized by an IoT systems. It's, it's still an MSS systems. What we have here is the type uh, two, which I, I saw on my slides, uh, which is direct connectivity from the sensor itself to the satellite system. And, and that's an IoT system. That's what we, we're talking about. That's why we need the additional frequency bands, even though they are allocated to MSS uh, in, in that respect. Um, and that's what I, the next WRC is going to look at, those additional uh, 2 times 10 or 2 times 20 megahertz of spectrum between 1 and 3 gigahertz, basically, uh, for these sort of nano-satellites, CubeSat satellite systems, in effect. I want to move on to maybe uh, other topics, uh, as we have uh, now approached uh, almost uh, uh, 45 minutes. We, we have another 10 minutes to continue our discussions. Uh, but it comes to the issue of... of um, uh, let's say, um, competitiveness or competition with 5G. 5G has been so, sort of uh, designed around the IoT devices, in effect. If you look at the, uh, the way it's been designed, the way it's been, at least 30, 40% of the market for uh, uh, 5G is, is, is basically going to be pushed towards uh, providing connectivity to IoT uh, sensors, basically, in general. And, and the issue of interoperability, first of all, uh, uh, you are all competing with each other, but are you interoperable? Can I actually use a sensor of, I don't know, company A in a satellite system of company B, for example? And, and is there a need to actually work together to actually become a force in pushing your, your voice? Because today, uh, as we know with Khalid, uh, the satellite community is, is very fragmented. And when they go to lobby for particular spectrum of particular uh, markets, basically, they are very fragmented. So the question is interoperability between yourself as well as what is the com competitiveness or competition with 5G? Who's going to take that? Yeah, maybe I could, uh, I could start because um, <clears throat> we have uh, a very modular system that allows us to do... Uh, direct to satellite if we want to from a, from a sensor. Um, but we would prefer to have the sensor talk to our edge device first. So we have those two alternatives and our edge device can utilize either our satellite network or someone else's satellite network or uh, 5G if we wanted to do it that way. So, so having the edge device gives us a lot of flexibility on the ground um, and we recognise that there are going to be circumstances where 5G is the preferred technology because of its coverage and uh, because of uh, better latency or some other uh, requirement 
that uh, the client might have. And so we will just select which technology. We're not uh, wedded to having our own sensors. We're very much open to uh, being agnostic as far as the sensors are concerned, especially talking to our edge device. So, so we sort of have a, on one hand, uh, direct to satellite component, mainly we're sensor to the edge device and the edge device can talk to either satellite or 5G. Mike, thank you. Uh, Alexander, from Canadian's perspective, Laurent as well, what's your view on this point? Um, well, we, we basically uh, have a system that is uh, direct to satellites and uh, that's where we come from and what we, we have uh, uh, built so far and uh, what we are actually building for the, the next generation. Um, well, th there are multiple uses uh, for um, a gateway model, uh, but actually it really depends on use cases when you are uh, really mobile, when uh, and you, it, it's hard to have a, a just a, uh, to have a gateway. We also met some uh, customers that, um, that may have the use of it, but that told us well, we don't want to be uh, uh, an operator because I'm like uh, a farmer on this field or, or, or somehow. And um, I don't want to have uh, this uh, unique point of uh, 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 collect that I will have to manage. Maybe I will break it and uh, uh, then uh, suddenly everything uh, uh, goes down. But on the other hand, we have other people that are very happy with uh, this kind of solution. So um, I think this addresses different use cases. Um, we at Kines uh, believe that uh, uh, having to deal with um, a gateway, your gateway on the run is uh, somehow uh, like uh, being a terrestrial uh, operator uh, because you, you have uh, actually uh, antennas on the ground. And so this is not uh, our uh, job, our business today. So um, our core of, of activity. So this is also why we are not going uh, here, but. Uh, I can understand it can uh, fit some uh, use cases. Uh, and obviously we have the, the argument of the existing ecosystem that uh, you don't have to change if you want to, to do that, but uh, it's also the counterpart. We haven't heard from Laurent yet. Laurent, any, any views on some of these topics? Um, actually, um, uh... It's a bit like Alexander. We, we've we've made the choice to to go with uh, L band from the beginning uh, because of the, um, uh, the 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 solution in terms of uh, miniaturization um, you, you you can uh, you can make. Um, we follow these new actors going five G and and direct to satellite five G connectivity. Um, indeed, it's interesting because it enables um, something um, comprehensive between terrestrial and satellite uh, connection. So when you don't have terrestrial, you can switch likely to, um, to satellite. It's, um, I guess it's not the choice we, we, we've made. There's uh, pros and cons for, for each. Um, our solution at Rastrocast is really uh, developed for the L-band, so optimized for that band. And, uh, and, and we stick to it for now. So it's, it's just different technologies. Okay. Uh, Harit, you want to say something? Yes, if I may, uh, Tony, sorry to take uh, your time again. But uh, uh, for me, I think we had a lot of discussion with regards to uh, the uh, incumbent, let's say, operators in, in the country and, and these satellite uh, IoT services, let us say, per se. Uh, uh, well, the way we see it is that the IoT is not a competitor to the 5G. It's, uh, they compensate each other, uh, really. When you talk about 5G, you're talking about broadband uh, and, and uh, smart city solutions that are, uh, that are uh, possible uh, right now with the, uh, using the 5G uh, technology is uh, ranging from uh, a big range of, of uh, use cases, uh, uh, mainly using the broadband. Uh, solutions. Uh, IoT may be while one of the applications that are uh, used in the 5G uh, and the 5G uh, uh, providers or the 5G world, let's say. Um, however, the big biggest advantage that we have in the satellite of, uh, uh, services is that 
you don't need to rely on uh, terrestrial infrastructure. We have this uh, uh, obstacle or this disadvantage where the uh, uh, terrestrial operator has to lay the infrastructure and this infrastructure is subject to damage, subject to uh, a lot of things. It's, it's very costly to reach to uh, remote, remote areas. So this is the place where I think the uh, uh, satellite operators come into play in, in compensating the places where the 5G cannot be reached or the 5G com- becomes very costly because as we say, laying the infrastructure, laying these things is going to be costly. Uh, there is also one, one more, one more uh, uh, underserved market, I think, which, which we've identified is the uh, vehicles which are in motion. Uh, to provide IoT services for vehicles in motion, I think that is something where the satellite IoT is going to play a big role. And, and we do uh, expect and anticipate uh, satellite IoT to have a big part uh, in, in, this, uh, in this use case. I uh, I see everyone is nodding their heads. Uh, I mean, uh, it, it is understandable that IoT is a broadband uh, sort of solution to to mobility uh, and so on. Um, it is actually being pushed by the 5G proponents also as a major use for IoT uh, devices uh, across the globe. Only only where IoT, uh, 5G is available, of course. Uh, uh, then you have to find those other solutions like the sat- direct to satellite um, IoT. May I want? I, w- I would like to maybe move on to the next topic that Mike had mentioned a bit earlier. What are you doing in order to, uh, and what actually are the solutions to space debris, which may be caused by these very small satellites, um, CubeSats or NowSats, mm-hmm. uh, which we've seen f- from Sanjay's perspective, how big they are, and when you start actually launching. A constellation of I don't know 20, 25, 30, 100 of those satellites. So are there are there are solutions to the space debris problem uh, that we keep on hearing today, and we see lots of um, uh, pictures and, and uh, videos about uh, the extent of this uh, space debris. Who's going to take that first, Mike? You want to start with that uh, since you raised it first? Sure, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, well, it it's. Um... Um, one of those questions that, um, of course, we all want to mitigate space debris and, we, all, of course, we all want to have collision avoidance if we can. Um, but uh, there are pluses and minuses about uh, implementing the current state of chemical propulsion, especially for very small satellites. Um, the FCC and NASA have proposed that all satellites in low Earth orbit uh, would have propulsion and have said that they would like their propulsion to be able to move 18 kilometres in one orbit. So you can read into that that that's chemical propulsion. Um, If you're putting up a constellation of 50 or 100 or 150 satellites that are small, um, we think that the current state of development of propulsion um, doesn't really lend itself to being added to 12 kilogram or 15 kilogram satellites. Um, A, because you won't have enough propulsion to do much other than to maybe decline in orbit for one collision avoidance. Um, you won't be able to reachieve, you won't be able to get, do station keeping to get back. Um, and we can see that there are some classes of satellites that absolutely are going to have chemical propulsion. So the large satellites that do need to station keep for a lot of uh, for a lot of years, uh, also man rated um, satellites. Of course, they need that. Um, but putting five thousand or however many uh, very small satellites that are going to be launched into low Earth orbit and equipping them with chemical propulsion seems to us a bad idea. The EU, I'm oh, sorry, the, yeah, the European Union or ESA actually, did a study recently saying that one of the major contributors to fragmentation in a collision is propulsion. And so uh, when we launch our satellites, um, we have to go to a space agency and get approval to be a space object. And a part of that is we do NASA's uh, DSA software to uh, say what the, to say that the uh, probability of collision is extremely low. 
and we're a very inert small satellite. So we think that's a good starting point. Um, the other issue is that most of the modelling is not based on extremely accurate TLEs, and so uh, there, there's uh, a degree of um, uh, chance involved in doing the collision avoidance anyway. So we think it's down to the current state of development of more benign technologies for collision avoidance. And also there are other possibilities if you're just going to get out of the way by uh, declining an orbit, then you could use drag instead. So there, uh, we just think that um, it's quite volatile putting 5,000 uh, small volatile devices into orbit and not getting a lot of return in terms of flexibility. So do you, do you think, uh, I'll let also the other panelists uh, talk about this, too, and I want to ask the question to the other panelists also. Do you think we should limit the orbital height of these kind of satellites in order to make sure that uh, when these spacecrafts are at the end of life, they actually come down gently and within a, a, a good time frame? What's the, what's the views from the other constellation companies? Laurent or Alexander? Yes. Yeah. Um, um, please go. Oh, sorry. Go, sorry. <laughs> um, yes, um, that's um, an advantage we have with the uh, Leo constellations. I mean, uh, the, uh, the the low altitude enables uh, us to rather quickly use the chemical or electrical propulsion could be as well to um, to um, to um, break or to lower the uh, the satellite and use the drag to re-enter uh, the atmosphere and burn um, there's well there's at Astrocast we made the choice to use that propulsion from the beginning in terms of, of chemical propulsion it's very true that because of the size of the satellites, uh, the amount of, of gas, because we use gas, is, is very limited. So we can do maneuvers, but we cannot fully deorbit the satellites, at least on the first generations. In the future, we want to switch to electrical uh, propulsion. So this is not then limited by the amount of, of chemicals you have on board, but rather the, the power uh, you have on the satellite. And this well, if, if you optimize well your, your power consumption, your solar panels, um, this can be managed. Um, and, and we speak about debris. It's, we have debris from the satellites, but we have also debris from the launch uh, itself, obviously. And these today are not, are not yet uh, tackled. And it's, it's, it's a real issue as well. Uh, we see new companies now tackling this business of... Um, of debris. Uh, we have one in Switzerland, actually, next door to, to our company, but it's, it's very expensive. I mean, if uh, you need to launch a dedicated satellite that goes and grab a specific debris and then burns it in the atmosphere, I mean, that's, uh, that's millions for, for just one debris while we have uh, thousands up there. So it's, um, it's a first step, but obviously there will be uh, a need for economy of scale. Right to to become a sustainable business. Alexander, you were gonna say something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's uh, actually a very important question um, because uh, uh, the difference of uh, some people um, sometimes uh, make comparison between a collision of satellites and collision of uh, airplanes or uh, cars, but it's obviously not the same because uh, when you when you have two planes crashing, you don't want to, but if it happens, then it goes down and it doesn't bother other planes. Uh, with satellites, you have a crash and you have debris for like decades over there that uh, prevent you to do anything. And everyone is, uh, uh, um, is afraid of uh, this uh, chain reaction of uh, what you see in movies and, and, uh, and other theories. And... Um, it, and it, it just cannot happen. I mean, it, if it's happened, it's just dead for everyone for uh, decades and even centuries. So it's really, you don't have to, uh, to be, uh, uh, I'm not uh, alarming, but um, um, it has to be tackled really properly. Um, and so uh, we, at Kinesis, we have uh, 
only, uh, I would say, uh, 25 sets, but still we have uh, uh, electrical propulsion on board that uh, should allow us to uh, do some things. And in any case, we are in a low enough orbit uh, to uh, re-enter uh, uh, atmosphere and burn uh, in uh, less than uh, 25 years. And uh, less than 25 years is considered as a good uh, 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 duration, but actually it's still quite long. And um, I, I would be uh, on the regulatory side. I think I would push strongly for uh, uh, really uh, more uh, um, constraint on that um, because we have propulsion that can that, uh, uh, that can allow us to do uh, much more than that. Uh, we have to, to 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 oblige it. I mean, at, at uh, from from a certain altitude. So it's uh, definitely uh, not. Uh, uh, really business friendly, but uh, uh, but uh, at some time at some point uh, we have to uh, to do it. Um, uh, I think uh, quite uh, to to do a quite uh, impact and uh, quite shortly because uh, otherwise it will be harder and harder to impose something. And uh, well, I, I don't think it's a good idea. Maybe Sanjay, you have a solution for us since you are the one that builds the actual satellites. You tell us what can you fit on these very tiny satellites that can push the little satellite back to Earth and burn up? Uh, Tony, I think uh, Mike and uh, Laurent and Alexander had actually covered uh, a lot of very, very important points. I think uh, with respect to active uh, debris removal and uh, you know having systems for making satellites re-enter are still in a very early stage. So it's going to take uh, at least a few years before these uh, technologies really mature. I think... Uh, you know, at least as a manufacturer, uh, you know, whenever a prospective customer comes to us, we we actually try to recommend them to uh, use uh, hosted payload opportunities if there is a possibility. Uh, usually, you know, uh, uh, their interoperability can actually uh, enable a lot of things. Um, until these uh, technologies get uh, matured. So a combination of interoperability, uh, support from the regulator, especially, to uh, ensure that, you know, uh, these, even if tech demo satellites are being launched, then them being launched in a very low Earth orbit where, you know, they would re-enter the Earth faster, could, uh, you know, uh, support uh, the ecosystem really well. I think that's my take on that. Okay, thank you so much. So nobody has given me a precise answer. What's the maximum orbital height you want to put these things so that they can naturally fall back down to Earth eventually after maybe a couple of years? It's, um, it's difficult to uh, come up with a good solution there because <clears throat> obviously uh, it's desirable to have a low Earth orbit that... Um, is uh, ideally below the space station, um, but that's not going to happen. And so most of the occupied orbits are going to be in the sort of a 400 to 600 kilometer range. Uh, so I think it actually comes down to um, what everyone's been saying, that you need to have some form of deorbiting assistance or some form of propulsion. We're not... We're not opposed to uh, propulsion at all, uh, just to chemical propulsion. And so uh, we, we acknowledge that there needs to be some way of deorbiting more quickly. And, uh, and in our modelling using the uh, space debris mitigation software, our model for deorbit active life and inactive life is about seven and a half to eight years. <coughs> As I am uh, going to give the floor to Sanjay, could you please look at the Q&A and type your, any answers you would like to provide to those people that have asked the questions? Uh, we won't have time to answer them live, but maybe if you could type them. Uh, we still have another three minutes, uh, a full three minutes to discuss anything else. Sanjay, you have uh, you raised your hand. In the meantime, for the others, if you could uh, type the answers to the questions, if you don't mind. Thank you. 
Sure, I think uh, you know uh, launching at least the tech demo missions. Uh, you know, uh, we could look at utilization of uh, launching from the ISS if that's a possibility, because uh, satellites would uh, re-enter uh, the Earth within a uh, few weeks. Uh, I think uh, about you know 500 to 600 kilometers could be an interesting spot if we want to uh, allow these missions to uh, stay for you know 10 to 15 years. And I think 600 kilometers and above. Uh, they should definitely make it mandatory for uh, the satellites to carry uh, electric propulsion system and not just a chemical propulsion system so that they could, you know, maneuver and uh, enable other people to coexist. I think that's, a, that's a, some kind of good proposal. Maybe we should actually work together to maybe pro, uh, write up a paper on that, uh, Sanjay. Uh, something like uh, around the ISS uh, should even though you don't have uh, propulsion, that's fine as long as you don't, you don't hit the ISS. Between 400 and yeah. 600, you should have some kind of a mechanism that can bring down the satellite eventually after the end of life. And above uh, 600 or 700, then you should have some active uh, propulsion mechanism to avoid collision, basically. Uh, are there any views um, between you uh, if uh, nano satellites or CubeSats of some sort should be allowed to go above the uh, LEO orbit. I mean, to MEO or even in, into GEO or whatever in terms of uh, other applications. Do you think actually it should, that should be something that should be allowed? Anyone? There are there are planet, planetary or moon, uh, or moon applications, for example, and uh, there could be other applications in, in MEO for... Uh, Earth observation or um, some kind of ionospheric measurements, for example. Do you think that this should be open to uh, CubeSats, for example, or very, very tiny satellites? I know someone uh, came to me when I was at Ofcom uh, a few years back. Uh, I think uh, they were trying to promote uh, satellites as small as, as your thumb, basically. Uh, I won't say the name. Uh, and they wanted to launch them uh, out in outer space, basically, uh, even going to Mars and, and the moon. Any, any views on this type of uh, applications? Uh, so, uh, Tony, in general, I think if we uh, look at the CubeSat market per se, right? Like if you look at 2000, early 2000s to 2020 today, I mean, a lot of companies have adopted uh, CubeSats for newer type of applications. And, you know, the trend of constellations was spurred because of the... Uh, I think one of the reasons was CubeSats for sure. So uh, as long as uh, you know uh, these CubeSats do not cause uh, harmful interference or cause problems in higher orbits, I think they should uh, definitely be allowed. Uh, as I understand today, majority of these CubeSats uh, are uh, being launched into uh, the lower the orbit. So you know uh, if if CubeSats can actually uh, or uh, constellation or a swarm of CubeSats can actually uh, steer newer type of applications in higher orbits or in interplanetary missions. I think it's a it's a great uh, opportunity uh, for research. So I think it should definitely be allowed. Okay, that's good. All right, uh, we're gonna wrap up now. Uh, we finished uh, the session. If you have any last uh, 30 second statement that you want to provide, you're free to do that now. Otherwise, I'm going to close the panel. Okay, you maybe just, just as a conclusion, uh, uh, sorry. Um, uh, well, first, thanks for this panel. And uh, <clears throat> I think it's really, it's really good that uh, we can talk from operator point of view uh, on the regulatory uh, issues, uh, because they are definitely in the center of uh, what we are doing. And um, and uh, and this has to be uh, discussed uh, very largely. So thanks again for the, the opportunity. Thank you, Alexander. We'll have more time uh, doing our webinars to come back and, and have a, a panel discussion on this point. Um, anyone else wants to uh, say anything? Otherwise, I'm going to close it there. Mike, you have a couple of questions. If you can answer them live, uh, just just have, you just have to go to the Q and A box. And type your answer. I'm going to leave you there, as I'm going to go now to the next panel and 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 introduce them. So thank you very much to all of you for coming today on this panel. It's a very interesting topic. I will pick it up as a panel discussion uh, at the Access Space Alliance itself, 
maybe in a, in a few weeks or months time we can discuss more details on the regulatory side it's a, it's a topic actually which is quite hot especially uh, going forward with the WRC on, on the look on the uh, need for more frequencies for, for this type of systems so have a nice day thank you very much uh, to be here and I'm going to now close the session and move on to the next one thank you very much thank you bye very everyone much. thank you panel thank you very much bye everyone bye bye, -bye.